Just please, uh, given that we will have this one, we, we won't be able to go around for the questions, so please repeat the question when there are open And questions. you have three scarves, and nobody so far given... Okay, yeah. for questions, you can give the scarves, okay. up to three scarves when people ask questions. Yeah, okay. but the first is... Mm -hmm. This is mine? I don't know. And you Yeah, I grabbed it myself. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, there's water down here. You want water? Out of time is okay. completely out of time. It's 40 minutes, including the questions, so that's how you... It's not really much. So we have this one, the freshly charged. Okay. So we can use one of you and the second, the, the other one will have the... Raz, jedna, raz, raz, jedna, raz, dva, raz, raz. No, there is uh, uh, eavesdropping in. <laughs> they just heard us speaking like the batteries are dead, you know. <laughs> okay, so it's time. Okay, to mute, can you hear me okay? Higher up. Hello? More up? Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Microphone working okay? All right. Luigi, good to go? Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Thiago da Silva. And this is Prashant. Um, we both work for uh, Red Hat at Red Hat. I'm a software engineer there, working uh, primarily on Swift. Uh, Prashant and I work primarily on Swift. I'm a uh, core developer for the community. Um, and we're going to be talking about what we have learned about Ceph Gluster in Swift. Um, the reason we wanted to talk about that is because it, we find it pretty cool. Uh, I consider myself pretty lucky because even though I work on Swift, I, I sit right next to um, uh, architects and, and developers for both Gluster and Ceph. So we share a lot of knowledge. We, we talk a lot about uh, principles of uh, distributed storage systems and um, I find it very interesting or we find very interesting uh, to see the problems that each one have and they share a lot of the same principles, the same issues and they come up with different solutions sometimes uh, or a lot of times they come up with uh, even the same solutions for uh, similar problems. So talking a little bit about those systems, uh, of course, they are all open source systems. Uh, they are, in a, in a way, trying to achieve the same thing, which is scale out storage. Uh, these are uh, um, systems that are trying to allow the flexibility of growing uh, your storage system. Uh, as your capacity grows, as your need grows, it, it, they can grow. Um, they also uh, are trying to, to prevent vendor lock-in, uh, and also to be run on commodity hardware. Um, the interesting thing about these three different systems is that they're very successful uh, projects. Uh, each one of them are deployed massively across uh, many different organizations. Uh, we hear about CERN running Ceph clusters. We hear about Facebook running uh, Gluster clusters. We hear about, of course, Rackspace, who was the original author for uh, Swift. Uh, you know, the, the huge uh, clusters that, uh, that they have there. So all systems, all these different projects 
are very, very successful. Uh, they share a vibrant community. Uh, they've been around for a while. Uh, so so it's, it's very interesting to see that uh, um, all three projects are, are running very, very well. Um, talking about a little bit about the, the storage types that they support. Uh, block, uh, Ceph supports block and, and object um, today. They are working very hard on CephFS, which will bring in the support for uh, file uh, on Ceph. Uh, Gluster supports primarily file. Uh, that's what it was designed for at first. Uh, but it also, there are community members out there uh, who also use it for block and object um, storage. Swift, on the other hand, was primarily designed for um, object storage, and it has no plans to support either block or file. So again, just talking a little bit about uh, how similar or different they are. Prashant's so, gonna talk a little bit about the architecture of each one individually. Um, these three storage systems themselves are very complex and vast. So we'll try to have a crash, crash course on each of these as quickly as possible. So starting with Ceph. This is how the Ceph storage stack looks like. At the bottom of the Ceph storage stack is um, the Rados object system. And uh, it's a reliable autonomous distributed object store. So before we get into the object system itself, what, what is an object? What, what is comprised of an object? When I say object, what it really means is you have an ID, you have the data in the object, and also a metadata. And the ID is used to store and retrieve the object. The data is, uh, is the actual content of the object. And in this case, uh, metadata are key value pairs, which are attributes of the object. And on this stable, very cool object store, you have other layers built on, on top of it. For example, we have um, Librados. So if you have a custom application, uh, with a specific use case that wants to talk directly with the Rados storage system. Um, it could link with Librados and store and retrieve objects in Ceph. Uh, you also have the Rados gateway, which is a HTTP server, uh, which provides a REST interface to the objects present in, in Ceph. Um, and block interface is one of the most popular and widely used uh, ways to consume storage. Um, when you have VMs, Ceph can export a uh, block device to the VM, and the VM can choose to um, attach it, format it with the file system, or if it has any uh, applications that can directly talk block, it can directly consume the block device itself. And then we have uh, CephFS, uh, which is a distributed POSIX compliant file system. Uh, it's, it's more like NFS, and uh, it can be uh, mounted and uh, consumed uh, in a VM or a client. So one difference um, in, in the way applications consume Rados directly and via Rados gateway is that um, Rados uh, is more um, low level access. So you can um, do things like store objects, partially update them. Uh, you can have compound operations on objects. You can get notified when objects get changed uh, but when you um, use Rados Gateway, uh, it provides a lot of additional feature sets, such as you can put objects and segregate them in terms of buckets. You can authenticate users uh, and provide ACLs based on buckets. You can also set quota on buckets. So Rados Gateway is a, a more uh, rich in terms of feature set. And also when you directly store objects over Librados, so the object size is typically small. And what Rados Gateway does is uh, it allows you to stripe objects um, so that you can have really big objects when you store objects via Rados Gateway. And if you have existing applications written in um, which talks to Amazon S3 API, you can just use them um, directly with uh, Rados Gateway. You just have to change the URL and point your application to uh, Rados Gateway instead. And it also supports the Swift API. So in terms of um, uh, Swift's terminology, uh, a bucket is a container. So if you are talking in terms of S3, uh, you can put objects into buckets. If it's Swift API, you can put objects into containers. So let's um, go a little deeper into 
uh, how the Redis object store itself looks like. So a Ceph cluster primarily has two kinds of daemons. So one is uh, the OSDs themselves, and these are usually um, hundreds to uh, thousands in numbers, and uh, they take care of one disk usually. Uh, it can be a RAID group as well. And uh, their primary purpose is to store objects and serve them to the clients. And when I talk to, when I say clients, it can refer to uh, a Libredo's application. Um, a client can also be the RBD layer. It can also be CephFS. And OSDs are, are not passive devices. These are very intelligent, uh, very cool devices. And they, they usually take care of replication in there. And uh, they also make a note of uh, other OSDs going down and report it to monitor. So monitors um, are the demons that, that knows how the cluster looks like. Uh, it knows what OSDs are down, what nodes are down, what, what nodes are up, uh, what devices are in the cluster, what devices are not. Um, and its, uh, its main purpose is to maintain the cluster membership and state. And it uses this algorithm called Paxos internally to vote and come to a consensus uh, for things whichever um, uh, for decision making. And monitors are deployed in small odd numbers um, because you usually need quorum when you make, uh, when you have to uh, put things to a vote. And if you have monitors in huge large numbers, it's, it takes longer to come to a consensus. Um, if you deploy CephFS, there's an additional daemon that uh, that needs to be uh, running. That's called MDS, uh, metadata server. And what it does is it it keeps track of all the file system metadata uh, that's there. Uh, this is how the um, Redos cluster would look like. Now let's uh, uh, look into a brief introduction on how Ceph places data itself in the Redos cluster. So Ceph, Ceph uses something called as the crush algorithm. So Ceph can store millions and billions of objects. And there should be some way to segregate these objects. Um, and here, a Ceph cluster is uh, divided into pools. So why pools? So um, there could be a use case where you need some set of objects replicated twice, uh, some set of objects replicated twice. So a good example is. Uh, let's say um, you provide a system where you allow users to upload your images, and you need to store thumbnails. Uh, you may want to store images thrice for resiliency, but you, you don't really care about thumbnails. If you lose them, you can always regenerate them. Uh, you may want to store just one copy of the uh, thumbnail. So that's where you can create two pools. Uh, one pool can store three copies. Another can one store one. And also, um, as these clusters are huge and contains so many objects, it's so hard to keep track of uh, where each object goes. So you group it into placement groups. And placement groups are a collection of objects. And these placement groups are mapped to OSD. So um, by default, when you have three replicas, three OSD daemons are responsible uh, to store and retrieve those objects. So here's how. Um, Here's an example on how Crush determines where to store and place the objects. So Crush uses the name, the identifier of the object itself, and the pool name to uh, derive the placement group. And uh, Crush knows which OSDs are responsible to store objects that belong to that particular placement group. So there is a primary OSD that, uh, that initially accepts the request from the clients and stores the data which is eventually replicated um, to two other OSDs. And these are synchronous. So the, so the OSDs uh, give an act back to the client only after all three writes have been done. That's uh, pretty much how uh, Ceph manages data placement. Uh, now let's uh, look into how Gluster does it. So here you have a bunch of nodes, and all of them contain um, some bunch of disks. So Gluster has this uh, terminology called as brick. So a brick is typically a disk um, 
or a mount point. And what Gluster does is it combines the um, capacities of these bricks spread across various nodes and presents, its, uh, presents those to the client as a single namespace. And the single namespace is called as volume. So volumes are made up of bricks. Uh, in this example, uh, you have those blue bricks which, are a, which form a replica set and the brown ones also form a replica set. So just like um, in the Ceph stack, you have uh, object store at the base. Here uh, you have a robust GlusterFS file system. And on top of GlusterFS file system, you have various other access mechanisms such as Fuse, NFS, uh, SMB, and also object-based access. Um, just like Ceph, Gluster also does not have a central metadata server. It does not um, have to look into a place or talk to a server to know where the files are. It can compute uh, on a real-time basis. And uh, just like Ceph, it also uses hashing to find where the, um, where the data is. So you have the entire hash space uh, divided into different ranges. And these ranges are assigned to bricks. And um, when, when you store an object, Gluster would know where to, when you store a file, Gluster would know where to place that file. So let's look at an example. Here I have three bricks um, of different sizes, two are of same sizes. And what Gluster does is it will assign a hash range to each of them uh, depending on the size of the brick. So if a brick is bigger, uh, it assigns a larger chunk of hash range so that more files would likely go into that brick. And then when, when you want to store a file or access a file, Gluster hashes the file name. And from the hash, it will know which brick to place the file in. And unlike other object store like Ceph and Swift, as GlusterFS is basically a file system uh, which allows rename, um, their renames are handled in a specific way because when you change the file name, the hash changes. Um, so when you rename a file, they create a special pointer file without moving the actual data immediately uh, that points to the real location. And um, as, as and when you want to grow your cluster size, you add devices. And when you add devices, uh, the existing data is moved to the new devices so that um, there's a uniform distribution again. Um, Gluster uh, has uh, has logic there to move it to a next brick, but uh, it it can um, it can point to uh, the original brick. So it it has this um, uh, logic of uh, um, it's called a link to file. So um, it's the same case as, as the rename again. yeah, it's the same case as the rename. So GlusterFS by design is very modular, as in you can stack up different modules. And in the earlier example, uh, you had seen bricks. Here, two bricks are combi combined as a replica set. And when the distribute module writes data, instead of writing to one brick, it will write to a replica set here. And the replication module in cluster is responsible uh, to provide high availability in case of failure. Um, it follows a transaction model. Either it writes to both the replicas or does not write to both. Um, and when one of the bricks or node is down, uh, and when it comes back up, uh, it has the capability to copy uh, the new latest file and overwrite the old stale file in the other node. Um, that's called self-healing. Yep, that's uh, pretty much about how Gluster does it. Um, <laughs> Swift is an open stack. Yeah. What happens when you have a failure in one of the bricks? What happens if the file is inside the brick when that brick physically fails? Yeah, and if you don't have the, the replication of the file, do you actually lose the actual files inside the brick? If, if it's just pure distribute, you do. If, if it's, uh, let's say, uh, the first brick goes down and you don't have access to that, um, there's a, a configuration in Gluster where, um, by default, you can still write to the other brick, 
the client still gets to do IO on the other brick. And when the first brick comes back up, all the IO that was done on the second brick is copied back to the first brick automatically. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, no. If if you go on the back end, you can still access them, but um, it, it won't be presented. Yeah, but I mean, clearly, if you make only one copy, yeah. and you lose that one copy, you yeah. don't see them. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's say the first brick is down now, um, and the client cannot access it. So all the IOs happen to the second brick. And when uh, the second brick is doing IOs, it will mark that file uh, saying that uh, the other brick is down, and this file needs to be healed back when the other brick comes comes up. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it, um, in in the in the back end, so there's a um, although there is no ce central metadata server, uh, there are uh, directories where the AFR module keeps track of files that that needs to be healed. So. So it, that's why it's so important to, to point out that it uses this hashing algorithm, this very deterministic hashing algorithm. So like Rick said, you have two replicas. One goes down. Your hashing algorithm for that file that is trying to store it still points to that second brick. It will point to both bricks, right? One you can't get to. The other one you can get to. So you still have access to your data, which I think also answers. Um, Swift is purely an object store. Um, in Swift, um, a cluster is logically divided into accounts, which contain containers, which eventually contain objects. So Swift contains four uh, services or daemons running. Um, one is proxy server, one is account server, container, and object servers. So the container servers keep track of what objects are stored in that container. The account servers, they keep track of what Containers are stored in that account, and um, these are stored in backend as SQLite databases. And um, just like objects are replicated thrice by default, uh, even the SQLite databases are replicated thrice. And a client uh, to Swift can be any HTTP client. It could be your mobile phone. It could be a web browser. And the proxy server here acts as the single entry point to the cluster. So clients never talk to the backend. Um, node directly, all the traffic goes through the proxy, and the proxy knows how how to route the request to the appropriate uh, daemon or service in the backend. And uh, for example, um, Wikipedia, all the images and thumbnails that you see in Wikipedia are stored in a Swift cluster, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so you can have a load balancer um, and uh, multiple proxies. Um, just like Ceph has a crush map uh, to know the uh, map of the cluster, there's something called as ring in Swift. And uh, these are internal data structures. 
So when I say a ring file, um, what, what an admin of the cluster does is um, he creates these ring files and pushes it out to every node so that every node has an idea of what the cluster is, uh, what it looks like. Um, so whenever you add devices or nodes, you need to recreate these ring files and push out to all nodes. And um, Swift also uses hashing without any central metadata server. No surprise there. Um, so Swift uh, divides the hash range into different partitions. And uh, it pre-computes these two tables when you create the ring file. So here, um, when, you, uh, when there's a request to create or retrieve an object, it will do a MD5 some hash of that object. And um, it will determine the partition. And each partition in this example is assigned to three devices. And then you have a table of devices. And Swift will know exactly that which object goes to which node. And when it creates these data structures and tables, so Swift has this um, uh, replica dispersion algorithm that, that makes sure that the replica pairs are in different domains. So if, for example, if you have uh, just one machine in your Swift cluster and three hard drives, it will make sure that the three replicas are in three hard drives. Uh, if you have a huge cluster, it will make sure that, let's say, the three replicas in, are in different racks. Uh, so Swift um, is very intelligent when it forms these ring files to make sure that the replicas are in different uh, failure domains. Um, that's, that's about uh, the architecture of these. Um, Chiago will explain about further similarities and differences. Thank so you. yeah, hopefully, um, you can keep that. Um, you know, you're able to, to see some of the similarities already that they share. So, so for example, again, they all, a scale-up system, they allow you to grow as your uh, capacity grow. They are all using uh, some kind of hashing algorithm uh, to determine where your data is located in what disk. Uh, they're all trying to save your data in such a way that if you have failure, uh, you don't lose your data. Uh, for that, um, they both primarily, up until now, they're, they're primarily been using uh, replication. Um, more recently, all these systems are also introducing um, erasure coding. Um, so um, looking a little bit deeper into you know, the similarities of them, so we can see that in Ceph, um, the Ceph client speaks directly or, or talks directly to the OSD, as Prashant mentioned. And you typically have a mapping of an OSD service to a disk, to a low-level disk. And, and, and um, the OSD. Um, disk is usually uh, formatted with an XFL file system, XFS file system, um, because Ceph uses um, X headers on the file system to store metadata. The same is true for also Gluster and Swift. They all using the XFS file system at the very low level to store the, uh, the data on disk. Um, so uh, in case of Ceph and Gluster, the Swift, the the client speaks directly to those uh, underlying services, in case of Ceph OSD, in the case of Gluster, uh, Gluster FSD. In the case of Swift, you have the proxy um, communicating with the Swift object server, which in turn also uses the XFS file system uh, to store the data there. Looking a little bit more in terms of how each system does uh, redundancy and rebalancing. In Ceph, you can determine your replication or your redundancy level, granularity, at the pool level. Um, so in, in a cluster, you can define several pools. And in each pool, you would determine, OK, I want this pool to have three replicas. I want this other pool to have two replicas, They're, you know, depending on your use case. In cluster, uh, you determine your um, redundancy at the volume level, and in Swift, you determine that at the container level. So you um, define a, what's called a storage policy, and when you create your container, you select what uh, storage policy you want. In terms of uh, where that data is placed uh, across different failure domains, in Ceph, it's managed by the crush algorithm, 
Um, and also in Swift is managed by the range like uh, Prashant talked about. So what Ceph and uh, Swift allows you to do is to define your cluster topology as you are uh, first defining your cluster. You can provide uh, uh, what your topology looks like, your cluster topology looks like, and both Ceph and uh, Swift will use its algorithms to uh, place the data in as different failure domains so that you don't lose your data. Uh, cluster differently, it's more of a manual effort uh, by the admin. You have to know as you're defining as you're defining your volume, you have to specify what disks to use for that volume. And the, the admin himself would have to know, you know, for this disk, you know, a disk is in this rack or this rack or this rack, so that they uh, um, are placed in, in their own different uh, failure domains. Um, for that, uh, Luis is going to save us, and uh, he's actually uh, working on a project, uh, it's called Hackaddy, that will automate that process in Gluster also, so that it uh, uh, automatically places or creates volumes in uh, using disks in different failure domains, so that it's such an automatic process. Uh, he's going to be talking about that tomorrow. So there you go. Did your ad for you. Uh, um, in terms of uh, both replicating data that has failed, as you guys were asking before, or uh, rebalancing data as you add more nodes, you need to rebalance um, the data. Um, in Ceph, it will rebalance a whole placement group. Um, so instead of, um, um, like Prashant talked about, instead of rebalancing or, or moving one file at a time, trying to figure out what file to move, it rebalances a whole placement group. Uh, in Gluster, it actually rebalances or um, replicates individual files. And in Swift, it will rebalance or replicate uh, partitions. So uh, again, remember that um, placement groups and partitions are sort of the same idea of their ranges of your hashing algorithm. Just to understand a little bit more about how each one uh, of the systems do replication, um, when a RDB uh, or a LibreDOS client um, sends data to a Ceph cluster, it will uh, communicate with one primary um, OSD. It will send data to that primary OSD, and that primary OSD is responsible for sending data to its uh, secondary and tertiary OSDs. Those three OSDs, again, are in the same placement group. Um, once it gets the OK from those uh, OSDs, it then returns to the client saying, OK, I have saved your data durably. Gluster uh, does more of a fan out from the client itself. The client is responsible for speaking to the three different bricks Again, I'm assuming here uh, that it's a three replica system. Hopefully that was clear. Um, but Gluster will communicate with three different bricks and send the data, will fend out the data from the client uh, directly. So the client here is responsible for doing the replication. Uh, in the Swift case, uh, you have the HTTP client sending the request to the proxy to put the data, for example. And the proxy is then responsible to fend out that data to the object servers, to, to three different ops, object servers. Um, what's the takeaway here is that all of these systems, they will only, they, they, they are responsible for storing your data in a very durable way. They will not respond to the client until you have uh, uh, some, quad, some kind of uh, quorum that your data has uh, been saved. So for example, in the case of three replicas, at least two of these services, two of these replicas must have responded to um, the client or the proxy, in the case of Swift, that the data has been saved. Um, just to show a little bit more of similarities, in the case of Ceph RGW, one sec, um, just to finish this thought. In the case of Ceph RGW, uh, it's very similar to Swift, where you have uh, an RGW gateway, or a Radius gateway, uh, and you have your HTTP client communicating with the Radius gateway, and the Radius ga gateway is responsible for the storing the data. In the case of Gluster, for example, if you didn't use uh, Diffuse client and you use an NF NFS, you would have an NFS server, and your NFS client 
communicates with NFS server, and the NFS server then is responsible for doing the replication for you. Yes? Thank you. Is that answer? Um, so we just wanted to show really quick um, where, um, how does it, your data look like in the underlying file system? So in the case of Ceph, Ceph provides some tools for you to use, uh, communicate directly with RADOS and put your data using RADOS tools and then look up where your data is look, um, in, in the cluster. So you can see that Ceph, um, like Prashant talked about, it actually breaks up into uh, small objects. It's not very human readable, so you'd have to, to go searching for it. Um, basically, you'd have to use some kind of tool to go look for it. Uh, in the case of Gluster, um, the, the directory structure, the file um, directory structure, uh, maps directly to how the data is stored on the brick. Um, and in the case of Swift, Swift actually takes your URL key, um, and it takes the, the end of that key there um, and hashes, and it stores the file with the, that hash name. So it's not human readable at all. It would be very difficult to go find that data um, on, on the underlying file system. Yeah, so um, the, all three systems, they use X adders to store a whole bunch of data. So yeah, it stores um, the, the file name, for example, there. Uh, in the case of Swift, you also have, and actually in the case of object storage in uh, Ceph, it also uses uh, the container database to also store some metadata about, um, about the, the, the object being stored. Um, in terms, again, just very quickly talking about some feature parity. Um, they all support some kind of quota. Um, Ceph supports quota at the pool uh, level. Um, Gluster at the volume level. Uh, also uh, directory, directory and I know counts. And Swift um, at the account and container uh, level. They all, uh, both Ceph and Gluster support tiering. That's sort of new features for them. Uh, Swift does not have a tiering uh, feature yet. Um, in terms of geo-replication, being able to replicate to far away data centers uh, with uh, higher latency, um, Ceph and Gluster have a active passive or a master slave geo-replication, um, but Swift provides a uh, active active um, replication where you can write and read your data from, from both uh, data centers. Uh, like, I, like we talked about before, they all support now erasure coding um, and also bit rot detection. Um, as you, data sits there on disk for a long time, you want to be able to detect uh, uh, bit rot. Um, and that's all we got. Um, we had a bunch of questions already. Any more questions? We got about five minutes or less. Yes? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, so you're talking about like how does it replicate data on a failure? Yeah, or, or, or whether I'm able to limit the bandwidth used for the replication. When my bandwidth just go, go down and the replication starts, I, I don't want to use the whole bandwidth for the replication. Yeah, um, oh boy. I know, for example, Swift uses a, um, um, it allows you to use a different network just for replication, exactly to limit that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure Gluster if Gluster supports that or not. 
Uh, so it would happen on the same uh, uh, network as the data path. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Do you, do you mean uh, if, if there's any throttling? Um, I, I think it's coming up. Uh, so as of now, all the cell fields are, are not throttled. Uh, they're adding the feature to throttle the bandwidth. You get a scarf, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Dispersion rules in, in Gluster. Um, right now, I know they have uh, um, uh, AFR, and I know they're talking about using um, NSR, which has been talked about for a while, um, and also. So um, they use uh, erasure coding and disperse volumes uh, to store, uh, to split data into uh, code in uh, the data into parity and uh, uh, two, ty two types of chunks yeah. and uh, that, that's a pretty new feature. Yeah. They use the and, coding. and striping too, I think it's been talked about for a while. <laughs> Almost. I know Gloucester supports InfiniBand, and Seth, I'm looking, Ilya, no, I'm not. It's work in progress. Sorry that I'm not expert on Gloucester or Seth, as you guys can tell more on the Swiss side, but I know uh, Gloucester supports InfiniBand, Seth is a work in progress. Okay. I think we're out of time. Um, I've just been told, I'm sorry. Um, but thank you very much. <laughs>
It's going to be an interesting uh, presentation. Can we <laughs> take off? <laughs> Did yeah. Yeah. Because of the mic? No, because of the title. <laughs> So same laptop, but at least you don't need to switch the laptop, right? And the slides. Yeah, yeah, same laptop. <laughs> same slides, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's at least <laughs> Let's start. So I need to mirror it? Yes. And tell Chago. Tell him to push the yeah. presentation. Just don't fall down, it's a step. It's invisible. invisible. Is it okay? So it's longer if I jump on the... Yes? It's interactive. Yeah, I can also go... 